Solar panels may be the key to solving our free energy issues. But of course, nothing's quite free in this world, is it? Even though solar panels are amazing, they can't directly power the grid, because solar panels have a DC output and the grid is AC. In order to power the grid then, we need to somehow make that DC AC. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at in this video, true sine wave inverters. Most true sine wave inverters use something called SPWM. But what is SPWM and how does it create a sine wave? We have to understand normal pulse width modulation before we can understand sinusoidal pulse width modulation. But it's quite a simple concept, so it shouldn't take too long to learn. Pulse width modulation is a way for us to change the average voltage of something. So how does it work? Well, we have a square wave, and the square wave is either high or low in a digital sense, high being on and low being off. When the digital signal is high, the voltage is equivalent to the input, and when the digital signal is low, the voltage is equivalent to zero volts. So, by changing the amount of time that the voltage is high relative to the amount of time the voltage is low, we can change the average voltage over that time period. When you do the maths to calculate the average voltage, you'll see that the duty cycle times the input voltage gives you the average voltage at the output. Of course, we don't want our voltage to be turning on and off, so after our pulse width signal, we'll add in a second order low pass filter consisting of a capacitor and an inductor to smooth out the peaks and troughs. The jump from here to sinusoidal PWM really isn't that big. All we have to do is have the duty cycle of our square wave increase and decrease in a sinusoidal way. I have greatly simplified this so the frequency is extremely low but you can kind of see how this would work now, with a lower voltage being a shorter pulse and a higher voltage being a longer pulse. In reality, there's thousands of different levels of pulse we can have, and we sample it thousands of times a second, so it's much closer to an actual sine wave, but that's quite difficult to represent, so I simplified it. If we have a high enough resolution, basically the number of different voltages we can produce, we can get extremely close to a sine wave. A higher frequency also definitely helps. This is a lot like in audio. When you see an audio bit rate, it has a number of bits, which is the resolution, and then the sampling rate, which is how often it samples it. This is exactly what we're doing with sinusoidal PWM. The only difference is that we only need to create a sine wave. So we can program in our sine wave and then just use that. This might seem like it's quite difficult to code, but it's really not. All we need to do is create a large table of values which we can fill with the values for sine. We then simply read them out and push them out onto our PWM timers at specific intervals and we get our average voltage pretty damn close to perfect. You'll probably notice that there's only one half of the sine wave here and if you've ever looked at mains electricity it does in fact have both halves of the sine wave, the positive and negative. So what we need to do in order to fix this is create a single phase inverter. An inverter basically allows you to flip the polarity of two wires. So let's take a look at how one works. Building an inverter is not that difficult. We start by taking four MOSFETs and putting them in a full bridge arrangement, allowing us to switch either wire, positive or negative. Very simply, if we turn the top MOSFET on, it will pull the center connection positive. And if we turn the bottom MOSFET on, it will pull the center connection negative. For the first part of our sine wave, the positive part, we can turn the top MOSFET on the first inverter on, 
and turn the bottom MOSFET on the second inverter on. When we want to switch the polarity for the negative side of the sine wave, we can do the opposite, turning the bottom MOSFET on on the first inverter and the top MOSFET on on the second inverter. I'm sure you're probably wondering how we can then convert this into a sinusoidal wave, because we'll get a square wave. Well, technically we could do this by syncing up pulse width modulation on the output. That would be completely stupid. Instead, what we're going to do is control these MOSFETs with an SPWM signal. Basically what we need to do is create four separate synced PWM signals. The first two are synced so that they're both on at the same time, creating one side of our sine wave. These are connected to the top MOSFET on the first inverter and the bottom MOSFET on the second inverter. We then need a second SPWM signal, which is exactly 180 degrees out of phase, which we connect to the bottom MOSFET on the inverter and the top MOSFET on the second inverter. On top of this, we'll want to add some drive circuitry. Switching four MOSFETs on and off actually uses quite a lot of current. Let's take, for example, the IMW65R057M1H from Infineon Technologies. This is a MOSFET I'm using in my own project where I build a true sine wave inverter. That has quite a low gate charge, around 28 nanocoulons, which sounds like a very small amount of energy, which is true. But in my circuit, I'm actually sourcing and syncing 112 milliamps every time I switch, which is far more than I could with the typical output from a microcontroller. So you can buy a half-bridge MOSFET driver to drive each one of your inverters. The big glaring issue you've probably noticed at this point, if you're paying attention, is the fact that solar panels are 18 volts, and the mains, depending on where you live, is either 120 volts or 240 volts. So clearly, we need some kind of step-up converter. Now, what you can do simply is put a transformer on the output, this is a technique used by a lot of YouTubers when they're demonstrating true sine wave inverters. A notable example is Great Scott, whose footage I'm using right here. The reason I'm showing this footage is because he did a great example of showing the issue with transformers, the fact that they distort the wave significantly. There is obviously a correct way to do this, which is using DC to DC conversion before the inverter. And I'll talk about that in a separate video, because it's a massive subject and it's arguably more complex than this one. Otherwise,